Hello and welcome to module 6.5. In this video, we're going to look at QZSS, the Japanese system, Quasi-Zenith Satellite System. And what exactly Quasi-Zenith means will become clear very soon. So let's take a look at the neighborhood of all satellites. And what you'll see is that QZSS lives out here at an altitude of geostationary satellites. However, it is not a geostationary satellite in that it has an orbit that's inclined to the equator. So the altitude is the same as a geostationary satellite, but the, the inclination of the orbit is something non-zero. And so the, this is something known as a geosynchronous orbit. The satellite st orbits the Earth at the same rate that the Earth rotates, but because it's not over the equator, because it's not an equatorial orbit, the satellite will appear to move up in latitude and down in latitude, or up in the sky and down in the sky from the point of view of an observer on the Earth. And so we've got some videos to show you what that looks like. So we'll begin with a, a symmetric geosynchronous orbit. And uh, what we're showing here, you can see the uh, equatorial orbit of a geostationary satellite. That's here, and there's a geostationary satellite. And then we've got an inclined orbit of a geosynchronous satellite, and that satellite's there. And the yellow lines are what's known as drop lines. They are just lines connecting the satellite to the point directly below the satellite at any moment. And then you can see beneath the geosynchronous satellite, you can see that that line draws out the path of the satellite on the surface of the Earth, which looks like an eight. So if we let this play, you'll see what it looks like. So the geostationary satellite, of course, seems like it's stationary in the sky, but the geosynchronous satellite, as it goes up and down in its orbit, draws out that eight on the surface of the Earth. And then if you have an asymmetric orbit, then you, you but with, with a similar altitude, you get a figure on the Earth that looks like this, like an asymmetric eight. And what this looks like in a simulation is, is the following. And then what happens is the satellite will seem to hang in the sky directly overhead for longer over a particular region, and that particular region is this high part of the asymmetric eight. So these two orbits I just showed you are, are actual orbits. Uh, the, the symmetric one is a, one of the satellites of the Beidou system, and the asymmetric orbit is the satellite of QZSS of Japan. And in the way you, you might remember from your uh, orbit class uh, several modules ago, there are just a few Keplerian parameters. The one that changes the shape of the orbit is E, the eccentricity. And this gives you, these numbers here should give you an idea of, of how small a change in the eccentricity makes quite a significant difference in a satellite orbit. So the Beidou eccentricity is approximately zero, and the QZSS eccentricity is deliberately set to something that's, that's not nearly so close to zero, and that gives you the asymmetry of the orbit, and that gives the orbit this, this property that it would spend more time over Japan than it, than it would over any other place. And so now if we go look at that, just the ground traces of those, if we zoom in on those, this is what they look like for those same two orbits. So now that you look at it with this view, you also notice that the Beidou satellite goes to a higher, la higher latitudes, top and bottom, and that is because of the inclination angle. They have an inclination angle of 55 degrees, and the QZSS, which we're studying in this video, has an inclination angle of 41 degrees. So that, uh, so that 41 degrees corresponds to how far in latitude it gets, and the asymmetry of the eight comes about from this eccentricity. And so then, just to review, now that you can see the coast of Japan here, you can see the point of this, that the satellite, as it does that part of its orbit, it'll stay very much in the same part of the sky, way overhead, uh, 
from the point of view of anyone in the cities of Japan. And so it's a very sensible orbit uh, to provide service over a particular region. So, so with either of these uh, orbits, we, we're going to have uh, an orbital period of one sidereal day because they're in sync with the rotation of the Earth. And so we have a, a little quiz here just to remind you about sidereal days and to ask what is the repeat period of the apparent orbit. So from the point of view of somebody standing in one place on the Earth, what is the repeat period for them for this QZSS satellite, this Japanese satellite, to the nearest minute? So I'll leave you to do that quiz. And uh, welcome back. And so now that you've done that, we can fill out this table. And so I've, I've shown three satellites here, a GPS satellite, which we know about, has a orbit period of exactly half a sidereal day. So after two orbits, the satellite is back where it started, the Earth is back where it started, and the repeat period is one sidereal day. For SBAS or any other geostationary satellite, when we talk about repeat period, we usually write it just as a dash. Because the satellite is geostationary, it's, it seems to be in the same place in the sky all the time. It seems to be directly overhead a certain place on the equator. So you, it's not really correct to talk about a repeat period. The satellite is always in the same place in the sky. However, with QZSS, if you tried out uh, that answer that uh, it's, all, it's always in the same place, that's not right because it's it's at an inclined orbit, so it'll seem to go higher in the sky and lower in the sky. And so its repeat period will be one sidereal day, which of course is 23 hours, 56 minutes. And that's one sidereal day. So that's, that's how we fill out that table. So a uh, little summary of QZSS. There currently is just one satellite in the system, but there will be seven satellites, and they will be as follows. There will be four geosynchronous satellites following these orbits, so four satellites chasing each other around this asymmetric eight, and then three geostationary satellites hovering over the equator at approximately the longitude of Japan. And then in terms of the signals they provide, they provide GPS-like signals. The, the, the signal structure is, is just like GPS so that it's easy to make a GPS receiver that's compatible with QZSS. And there are several uh, models of GPS receivers on the market right now in cell phones that have uh, QZSS capability. So if we go look at the signals, what I'm going to start with the GPS signals. You'll recognize this from a few videos ago. And you can think of QZSS as like the GPS signals without the military signal. So PY code, which is military, you can cross that out, M code, cross it out, PY code, cross that out, and that out, and then these lobes here would disappear. And basically, what's left on that top line is all included in QZSS. However, QZSS is also a kind of look ahead into the future of GPS because it also includes the L1C signal, which is scheduled to come online with GPS Block 3, but that's only going to happen several years from now. And the QZSS satellite actually provides this L1C signal already. And so if you go look in the interface control document for QZSS, this is what you see. And there's L1C, L1CA, the CA code that we've been studying throughout this course is supported. L2C is the civilian signal on L2, same as that. And the signal on L5, it supports the same signal as GPS. And the, the only thing we haven't paid attention to yet in this picture is this thing, LEX. And LEX is this L1 experimental signal. That's something unique to QZSS. But the rest of it is really just a GPS lookalike. And so it's a very convenient uh, addition to the constellation of GNSS satellites. So if we go to the current status, uh, once again, I'm uh, recommending this uh, page from GPS World uh, site, which you can get by just Googling GPS World Almanac. However, this is one case where the way they've organized things is, I believe, not quite right. They, they put QZSS in a table 
of SBAS. And, and uh, the SBAS is the augmentation system, and sometimes QZSS does get lumped together as an augmentation satellite, but that's not strictly correct in that uh, the SBAS satellites are primarily there to augment GPS and provide additional data, whereas QZSS is a, is a bona fide navigation satellite. It's a dedicated navigation satellite built simply for navigation, and it just the, happens to be the first of a regional constellation. And so maybe because there's only one of them, it doesn't quite get the respect it will get uh, in a few years. Uh, to, so, but nonetheless, the GPS World Almanac is a, is a very good place to go and get information about all the different constellations, as I mentioned in the previous uh, video. And then specifically for QZSS, this site uh, that belongs to JAXA, which is the Japanese space agency, the Japanese equivalent of NASA, has some excellent data, that, data on QZSS. And finally, uh, QZSS has another difference from GPS. Uh, the satellite comes with a cute name, in this case, Michibiki.